Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for November 8th, 2021. It's the time of week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython, which is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join us anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. While this meeting happens once a week in the CircuitPython dev text channel and CircuitPython voice channel, there are a large number of channels that you can visit with people chatting at all times of day from all parts of the world. Uh, this meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time, except when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. If the meeting time has changed, we'll notify you on Discord. There um, is also a calendar available on uh, GitHub that we keep updated, so you can subscribe to that and get it conveniently in your own calendar application. This meeting is recorded. Uh, we record the video from the text channel and the audio from the voice channel. If for any reason you don't like to have your voice recorded, you're still welcome to participate by leaving us notes. We post the video and audio of the meeting to YouTube, and then from there release the audio as a podcast. If you find that we're not available on your favorite podcast service, please let us know. There is a notes document to accompany this meeting and the recording. If you want to participate but can't make it, that's where you can leave your hub reports and status updates for us to read off during the meeting. Uh, as we go through the meeting, I'll add timestamps so that after the fact, you can use it to skip to view the parts that only interest you the most. The meeting tends to run 60 to 90 minutes, so we think that that is a pretty handy option to have. Uh, a link to the notes document is posted to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord every week in advance of the meeting. And if you are watching or listening to us, look in the show notes uh, to find the text of the notes document. This meeting is held in five parts. Next up is community news, a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. This is a preview of the Cir community run uh, Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. Second is the state of the CircuitPython, Libraries, and Blinka, where I am in big trouble because I didn't copy that into the document to read off. Uh, Katni, can you save my bacon? Anyway, that will be a statistical overview of the entire project and a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. The third part is Hug Reports, where I will owe Katni a, an extra hug for copying that data into the notes document. Uh, as a perfect example of highlighting the good things folks are doing and taking the time to recognize the awesome folks around us in the community on Discord, GitHub, and beyond. The fourth part is status updates. Status updates is our opportunity to sync up on what you've been up to. We invite everyone to take a couple of minutes and talk about what they've been doing since the last meeting and what they'll be up to uh, until the next meeting. And then the final part, if needed, is called In the Weeds. It's our opportunity for long-form discussions. They can either come out of status updates or be something that you've identified ahead of time as just being too long to fit within that format. It can grow out of a circuit Python issue or bug report or pull request on um, GitHub and so forth. Anyway, that covers the main parts of the meeting. And with that, I will skip back to the notes document and head to community news. These are just a few excerpts from the uh, great newsletter that Anne kind of uh, spearheads, but takes um, contributions from the whole community. And so I'll just kind of read them off to you. Uh, I skipped a couple of the top headlines, and I'm going to start with CircuitPython course connecting a robot cat to the internet. In a new LinkedIn learning course, Sherilyn Gonda shows you how to use CircuitPython to program a robot cat that reacts to events while connected to the internet. Charlene shows how to code for common hardware devices like LEDs and servos and explains a common messaging protocol for IoT projects called Message Queue Telemetry, message queue telemetry Transport, or MQTT. If you're looking for an internet cat video that actually teaches you something useful, join Charlene as she shows how to program this robot cat. There is a link to LinkedIn, and the course is $35 after the introductory chapters. Um... Yeah. So next up, Meet the Maker covers Liz Clark from Blitz City DIY, who you may know from uh, her appearances on Show and Tell now and again. 
Uh, so yeah, the uh, the YouTube channel is apparently called Meet the Maker, and I'm not familiar with it. I will check it out soon after the meeting. Next up, ZDNet has a list of top programming languages, and while they list JavaScript as top at 16.4 million, uh, Python is number two at 11.3 million. They say that it is most popular in DS slash ML and IoT apps, so they don't even know about the Python on hardware world. We'll have to rocket up that list someday in the future. Um, yeah, so heading down to some projects. Um, the bare metal circuit Python uh, is running on a Raspberry Pi with HDMI and an e-ink display. Scott is working on a port of circuit Python that runs on bare metal on the Raspberry Pi that is without the Linux operating system. So of course Lady Ada wanted to see what works with HDMI since the REPL is available and she happens to have an e-ink HDMI display. It is awesome! One of the plans is to make a little computer with a keyboard that is just CircuitPython. Write code, make art. With HDMI, have the output go to a little portable projector. Kids can make cool kaleidoscopes or make a haiku computer that shows the last one made when the power is off since this is e-ink. And there is a link to the Adafruit blog. And then next up, there were a couple of cool looking stories from CircuitPython school. This one was called, There's a Jedi in my microcontroller, sensing gestures with an Adafruit APDS 9960. And we've got links to YouTube and that comes via Twitter. So long story short, there is a lot more in the newsletter. So if you just uh, head over to subscribe to it at uh, adafruitdaily.com, you will get a lot more in your mailbox tomorrow morning. The newsletter highlights the latest Python and hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, that's us, Python and MicroPython developments. And we really want to hear from you. To contribute your own news or project, you can edit next week's draft on GitHub and submit a pull request with the changes. You can also tag a tweet with CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. Send us your project, your friend's project, your cat's project, just uh, whatever. We want to hear about it and we want to spotlight you and uh, get you exposure for the cool stuff. It can be really simple. It can be really complex because we also you know, value the contributions of people kind of at all stages of their journey through CircuitPython and computers. So that is all I'm going to tell you about the newsletter. Next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. This is looking at the statistics from some scripts uh, that we run on a daily basis and that report over the last seven days of activity, give or take. So overall, across uh, everything on Adafruit that is CircuitPython related, uh, we had 81 pull requests merged, which is a pretty big number, and Katni will tell us more about why that is a little later. Those came from 16 different authors, and uh, less frequent contributors are Tectric and Weiwang83. Uh, I think 560 has contributed before, but thank you, and also it was nice to talk to you earlier this morning. And then BL three uh, is a name I also don't recognize. So thanks to everybody, especially if you are a new or newer contributor. Um, and then also thank you to our 11 re reviewers. Uh, reviewers look over pull requests and offer feedback. They uh, test the pull requests and just help us ensure that the changes that we make uh, are the highest quality. So thanks to those 11 people who help us maintain the quality of CircuitPython and the libraries in Blinka, as well as those who aren't specifically credited as reviewers, but when you comment on pull requests and um, on issues, you are all helping us uh, ultimately create a better program. Anyway, issues-wise, we had 24 closed issues by 11 people, while 14 people opened a total of 15 issues. So that's a nice decrease in issues week on week. And uh, I'm not sure whether this is accurate or not, but we think we may have remo removed the Hacktoberfest label from 22 issues. Those are labels left over from the Hacktoberfest um, contest last month and were kind of a signal as to PRs that we hoped newcomers could resolve. Moving on, I will hand the talking stick to Scott to tell us about what's going on in the core. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. Okay, so for the core, these uh, the repo github.com slash adafruit slash circuitpython. Uh, in that repo, we had 12 pull requests merged from nine different authors. So thank you to all of our authors. 
we have four reviewers uh, who helped support those authors, so thank you to those folks. We have 10 open poll requests, which is not too bad. The oldest is 65 days old, um, and it's kind of an even gradient from there on. Uh, so we are keeping up generally with things. Uh, Issues-wise, we had five closed issues by three people, four opened by four people, so we're net down one, which is great, uh, for a total of 447 open issues, which you can find on the GitHub repo. Uh, we keep track of kind of how we are managing incoming issues through milestones. Uh, generally, uh, we prioritize what issues we want to work on based on the milestone, and the milestone characterizes usually the release that we're targeting or we want to make sure and fix something for. So we have uh, zero open issues for the 7.1 milestone. We have 21 open issues for the 7.xx, which is like anything but before eight. And then we have seven open issues for eight. Uh, we also, these milestones also help us track the things that we've just not looked at. And we have one issue not assigned a milestone that we'll have to take a look at. Although I have done some this morning. Um, anyway, we're continuing to work. Uh, we should do a 7-1 like I've been saying the last few weeks, but all of us are kind of involved in stuff right now. So once, I think once we, once we wrap up the work that Dan, Jeff, or I are working on, we'll, we'll take a crack at 7.1. Um, if anybody is interested in uh, helping with releases or, or core stuff, let me know. Um, releases do take some, uh, some like privileges and accesses to things uh, for like blog posts and things. But um, there's no reason that we couldn't uh, have more work done by some core contributors outside of Adafruit. So if you want to get more involved in the core, please always just uh, reach out to reach out to us. And we'd, ha we'd be happy to help you level up and get more people working in the core. Um, so that's it. All right. Thanks, Scott. Next up is the libraries, and that is traditionally a section that is done by Katni. So step on up. Thanks, Jeff. So this section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that begins with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few other things, such as the community bundle and our cookie cutter. So we had 68 pull requests merged by seven different authors, including a couple of the new folks that um, Jeff highlighted earlier, which is great, and seven reviewers, including our newest reviewer, uh, which is also excellent. Um, the list of merged pull requests are all very recent ones, which makes sense um, for reasons that I will discuss later. And uh, it leaves us with 58 open pull requests, which has increased significantly since that number, but will also have decreased significantly the next time the, the uh, report is generated. So uh, that number will probably stay the same. We had 14 closed issues by eight people and nine opened by eight people, leaving us with 627 open issues. 260 of those are labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, um, including open pull requests, open issues, and library infrastructure issues. Um, these are all things where there is an opportunity to contribute. If you want to uh, get into reviewing, you can check out the open PRs. Uh, if you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, um, feel free to uh, check out the code for syntax or spelling or that sort of thing and let us know that you did that. That's always helpful. And uh, as you get more comfortable with um, leaving comments for review purposes, uh, we can eventually level you up to joining the review team. And uh, if you are interested in contributing code, you can check out the issues. If you're new to everything, good first issue is a great way to start. If you're looking for something a little more complicated, bug or enhancement is a great thing to search for. Um, pick something that interests you and give it a try. Leave a comment, let us know you're working on it. If you need assistance, we are always available both on GitHub and Discord. The list of updated libraries this week, I will not read off, but there's a number of them, uh, which will probably be longer over the course of the next couple weeks. Um, overall, uh, we, I decided to update PyLint. Um, so that's why there's so many PRs. Uh, it, it wasn't terrible. The, the last time we updated Pilot was far worse and we had waited a very long time to do it. Um, so I, when I ran it and it wasn't terrible, I figured now was a good time to do it. Uh, all those PRs are in. Um, they're not all merged yet, but they are completed. So that's, uh, we're in a really good place with that. Um, I updated uh, our um, 
pre-commit config file, it was doing wonky stuff with the example code to avoid the duplicate code check, but PyLint finally implemented a the ability to just disable the duplicate code check very easily. And so that's what we're doing instead of um, doing the weird stuff with the example code, because apparently it was running it on each example more than once. Uh, it was very slow. And it's significantly faster now and only running one time on each file. Uh, so that's actually part of what sparked all of this, and I'll explain all that later. Um, but overall, we are in a good place, and um, I'm really excited to still see um, a number of the good first issues being picked up by folks. Um, and uh, it's always a great way to get started with this is our good first issues. So thanks. Thank you, Katni. And then to round out this uh, section on the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, you might guess that next up is Blinka. And Melissa will tell us what is going on in that end of the world. Hello. So Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had one pull request merged by one author and two reviewers. Uh, there were there are four open pull requests still, and there um, have been five closed issues by two people and two open by two people, um, leaving a net of 64 open issues. There was one issue removed. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, had the Hacktoberfest label, but it got removed. Um, let's see. There were 13,232 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month, and we are currently up to 77 boards with the addition of the new Raspberry Pi 02W. And that's it. Thank you, Melissa. Next, we will move on to Hug Reports. Hug Reports are our antidote to negativity and the opposite of a bug report. If there's somebody in the community who has been up to good stuff, please call them out in a good way and uh, let us know. So I will kick it off and then we will continue alphabetically and then uh, head back to the top of the alphabet to get the people who are before the letter J. Uh, so first of all, I have a hug report to Katni for coming to me about the pre-commit stuff uh, that she will be talking about later. I had some opinions and she gave me a very good hearing and I think we came to a good solution. Uh, thanks to Dylan, thanks to Keith the EE, and thanks to Mark among others for work on all the pilot PRs that were one result of this. And uh, thank you to Scott for swapping meetings with me while I will be unavailable coming up. And next, let's hear from Katni. I'm so used to there being more people before me. Not today. All right, I know. So um, first up, a hug report to Dan and Rose for a lovely chat about the LED animation library. It was fun to watch them bouncing different ideas off each other, um, and everybody really enjoyed it, so that was nice. Uh, to Foamy Guy for cleaning up after, the, after Hacktoberfest when Adabot failed to do so. Um, the uh, the um, libraries. Uh, the issues, labels, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> I got there. Um, the issue labels were not removed by Adabot, um, so we did it m manually, basically, and I appreciate that. Uh, another one to Foamy Guy for updating the PyCharm page and the Welcome to Circuit Python guide to actually be useful again. To Jeff for going over the pre-commit config YAML update with me. To Dylan for working through the PyLint update. To Keith the EE and Mark Gambler for picking up a lot of the PyLint PRs and to uh, Keith EE for looking into an import style difference and reporting back that they were the same thing and making suggestions as to which one to go with, because that was greatly appreciated as well. Um, I did it uh, a way that I thought was appropriate, um, which was different than the way Dylan had done it on every other PR that she had done, and it turns out they're identical, but we needed to pick one for style, so I went with the one that had been used in a majority of the libraries versus the one that I had done once. So that's been fixed, and everything is now the same. And that's what I've got. All right. Uh, I will read notes from Keith the EE, and then we'll move down to Maker Melissa. So uh, Keith says, hugs to Dylan for getting the CircuitPython libraries working with the PyLint update, to Katni for getting PyLint working and helping review the pull requests, and uh, at everyone for continuing to be awesome. And next we'll go to Maker Melissa and then to Scott. 
Hello, I wanted to give a hug report to Carter for testing out the Pi Zero W 2W and also testing it out with the new release of the Raspberry Pi OS. Um, I wanted to give a hug to Katni for having a nice chat with me. Uh, everyone who wished me well was out and a group hug to everyone else. Thank you, Melissa. Next up is Scott, and then we'll head to the top of the alphabet with Carter who I guess I'll be reading the notes of. Hello. Uh, for me, hug report to Ivan, IGRR, from Espresso for writing a nice SD uh, library and being open to collaboration. Uh, so I'm starting with the, the ST stuff from the ESP IDF. So thanks to Ivan for reaching out to me on that. Uh, thank you to Keith the EE, Katni, and Dylan for dealing with the pilot upgrade. Um, I think I missed Mark on there, too. Thank you, other folks, for covering that. Uh, thanks to Gambler for the display I.O. on LED glasses. I think that's really neat, and I hope to highlight it. Uh, Hug reports Anic Data and Microdev for the Wi-Fi monitor code. Um, being able to debug Wi-Fi through an ESP would be really neat. And then uh, lastly, a Hug report to Tectric and 560 for uh, continuing to work on adding type information into the libraries. That's it for me. Yeah, I need to check out Mark's work on the LED glasses as well because, well, I still don't have a set of glasses, so I didn't <laughs> uh, didn't do it yet. But yeah, that's cool stuff, and they definitely deserve a hug for that. Anyway, uh, I have a note from Carter who has a hug for Foamy Guy for taking a look at updating text label guide to cover a common mistake. Next, I'll read some notes from Seagrover and then hand it to Dan. Seagrover also has a hug for Foamy Guy for the detailed descriptions of the fundamental concepts and design of display I.O. layouts and widgets. All right, next is Dan, then I'll read notes from David. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeff, thank you for uh, improving the bootout.txt updating, which uh, got broken at one point, and I had submitted a PR which just barely fixed it, and you did a, a more thorough job. And I understand you're fixing one aspect of that now. Mm -hmm. And thanks also to Dave Putz, um, again, for looking at very hard to fix things that have to do with PWMIO and other pulse things that are take a lot of work to understand the low level details of. I, we really appreciate that. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dan. All right. Notes from David Gloud, who um, I think is listening in. Hi, David. Uh, a hug for Scott for continuous effort to make the Pi single board computer work with CircuitPython. One for Dan for the custom HID devices learn guide. One for me for the BLE CAT thermal printer learn guide. And one to Katni for the ATtiny817 Seesaw learn guide. And now I will let Foamy Guy round out the section of hug reports. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, this week, hug reports for uh, GitHub user, I think it's Clarto Clar Clardotush, Clardotush? Uh, but the person behind the KMK uh, firmware. So I had a chance to play with that this week and it was really interesting. So I definitely appreciate all the work that they did for it. Um, to Carter uh, for discussing some ways to improve the display text uh, guide in the learn system. And to Tectric who has uh, added lots of type info and done several other uh, PRs recently I've seen. So definitely thanks to that user. Um, and that's all for me, thanks. Thank you and thanks everybody. The next section is status updates. Similar to hug reports, we will go in a round robin fashion. And uh, we want to hear what you've been up to since the last time we had a chance to chat uh, and what you hope to accomplish in the next week or until you're able to join us again. And uh, if there's any place you're stuck, you can throw out a question and maybe people will answer you in the text chat. But if it's a longer discussion or needs to be verbal, please uh, put a topic in the weeds and we will um, talk about whatever is on your mind that's related to CircuitPython. And of course, we also invite you to talk about things that are outside of CircuitPython, but uh, that you want to share with us because a lot of us are also friends and pals and it's a community. So anyway, let us know. Tell us how uh, your progress goes laying in vegetables uh, in canned or pickled form for the winter, for instance. That's not what I'm going to tell you about. Anyway, so uh, last week, I had am amassed just a bunch of uh, work in branches that were in progress. And so I got as many of them turned into pull requests as 
pull requests as possible last week, and that makes my list look a little bit long. Uh, anyway, as Dan mentioned, I improved bootout.txt writing, but unfortunately I broke safe mode. There's a second pull request out that will fix safe mode. So it's a little improvement where um, in addition to writing the information that it always wrote, it is now going to also write uh, the actual output from boot.py up to 500 bytes or so of it um, and only rewrite it when it actually changes. So it was a little tricky to do, uh, but it's a lot better because you can like print, I installed my USB descriptor, and then you can look in bootout.txt and see that that happened. And I think, but did not verify uh, that an exception would also appear there. I will check on that after this meeting, so put that on my to-do list. Uh, anyway, another PR that I wrote that needs to be tested is to allow MP3 decoder to accept file names in addition to an opened file. And this is reacting to PyLint liking to suggest that when you use open, you use it with a with statement. And if you are actually doing that with an MP3 file, it might or might not be right depending on your goals. Uh, but if you can just tell MP3 decoder the name of the file, um, then PyLint isn't going to notice or isn't going to, to give you this possibly incorrect advice about using a with statement. Uh, next up on uh, the SAMD microcontrollers, I fixed an arithmetic error calculating the watchdog timeout. Um, on the Espresso microcontroller, parallel image capture now supports what is called continuous capture. So your Python code can be running on the previous frame while the camera is sending the next frame to the microcontroller. And that can like speed the responsiveness of your camera-based application. I put in a pull request that was just merged to add an alpha blending routine to bitmap tools. So you can say, I want a new bitmap, or I want to put in my output bitmap, one that is a blend of 30% image A and 70% image B. And uh, we think we have some camera related uses for this, but also I think it's just generally uh, useful because now you could maybe actually blend text on top of a bitmap. And this is really only going to work well on the microcontrollers with a lot of memory, which is the ESP32-S2 with PSRAM right now, because, of course, you, you need to have your source bitmap A, your source bitmap B, and your destination bitmap, so already you're using up a ton of memory. Uh, anyway, next one up that is still in progress is Dither. So you can take a uh, 16, an 8 or 16-bit bitmap and turn it into just a black and white bitmap. And... We think there will be uses for this. Again, there's kind of a camera project in mind for it, but also some other stuff. Um, the Rainbow I.O. module, there are approximately three boards where we had to disable it because it didn't fit, but our goal is to have it enabled on every board that really has the possibility of having a color NeoPixel or other LED on it, and I was able to find room on one of those boards and re-enable it. We've still got a couple more to go. On Sunday, I looked around and found some other places that we can save firmware size, uh, but I haven't turned any of them into pull requests yet. There's one that is really not a trade-off at all. It's disabling some functionality we don't use. There are two more that are kind of slight degradation in functionality, but that I don't think anybody is actually using. So those will become pull requests someday when we could use a couple hundred bytes in order to fit something like Rainbow I.O. on one of our microcontrollers. And then the last one up that made my list is uh, I helped with a problem in nvm.toml, which is a GitHub repository that includes information about flash chips, and reported a bug in Cascade Toml, which uh, Scott was kind enough to confirm it was a bug. Um, and that bug led to the first problem not being detected right away, I guess, is the story. So anyway, uh, this week, uh, with Dither working, I can work on completing the camera to thermal printer project idea. So hopefully that will soon become a guide on the learning system using the ESP32-S2 with the UART thermal camera, UART thermal printer, excuse me, and then the OB7670 or other camera. So you'll be able to hit the shutter button and have your photo come out. It'll be, you know, lo-fi, um, similar to Game Boy camera, I guess. I never owned one. And uh, several of the above PRs that I mentioned will probably need revision before they can be merged, and the dither is definitely one of those. 
So uh, coming up after that, I will be missing the meetings on November 15th and 22nd, and I will be back, um, yeah, basically at the end of November. My Discord activity will probably also be reduced. Uh, that's what's up with me, and if that wasn't long enough, I have already looked ahead at what Katni's going to tell us about. So take it away, and then after you, we will head to Melissa. All right, so I've been talking for several weeks about the Welcome to CircuitPython guide update that is now in moderation, but the guide is mostly live, so you can check it out now. The new pages include the CircuitPython documentation page, which is live, and the How Do I Learn Python page, which is not yet live. Also updated the Welcome to the Community guide uh, to include circuitpython.org and reference the libraries more and link to the new CircuitPython documentation page within the Welcome to CircuitPython guide. Um, our new products and photo team is working on new sets of CircuitPython compatible board images based on mine and Dan's suggestions. Two sets of them are done and they look amazing. I'm really excited about this. Um, last week ended up down a when you give a mouse a cookie hole with a documentation build failure on the LED animation library which turned out to be related to read the docs using an ancient version of Sphinx remotely versus the latest version we were running locally. All newly created projects use the latest on read the docs, so we do not need to be concerned about this issue on anything created after the 20th of October in 2020. I think that data is right, but it doesn't matter. We're beyond it. So I spent a couple of hours looking into forcing read the docs to use the latest Sphinx, which involved adding a new file and changing the existing one. Um, then I remembered that the way we were running PyLint on the example code was for some reason running it multiple times. Um, which, like I said earlier, was doing more work than necessary, but also making it slow, which is um, what I was running into trying to fix the read the docs issue. So I figured since I was already going to need an Adabot patch, I should fix that issue as well, and then remembered a user running into a pilot locally being different version than the pre-commit and issue, and figured if we were going to update the pre-commit config file anyway, I might as well update pilot. So I ran pilot across the bundle in a crude way, and it didn't come back super terrible, so I figured we're in a good place to do it and went ahead with it. So to make a very short story very long-winded, we're upgrading PyLint on the libraries to 2.11.1, so make sure you've pulled the latest code before working on a library and also have updated your PyLint if you are running it separately. Um, to that end, I've been merging PRs, and I did a few myself as well. This week, I will be merging any PRs that are left for me. Uh, thank you so much to folks who have been picking those up. Um, and uh, it turns out I broke the docs with my fix, uh, but I know why. So we have a fix, um, which I'm going to bring up in the weeds, because it's two options, um, and we pick one of the two. Um, I started the guide for the Adafruit Monochrome 1.12 inch 128 by 128 OLED graphic display. Uh, it's in the shop, but not available yet. Um, so that guide will be, um, I, it depends on, because I won't have the hardware to finish the code parts, but the core of the guide will be done this week. Um, I'm going to go through existing uh, pretty pins files starting with RP2040 and make sure they're uploaded to the guides and PCB repos where they need to be. Phil B made a bunch of them that never ended up in their homes. Um, continue working on adding a page to the LED animation library guide about loading part of a library. This came out of a lot of people wanting to use LED animations on M0 boards that are not express and even M0 boards that are express. Uh, can't run all the animations. So um, we thought about putting this in the Welcome to Circuit Python guide, but it really didn't make sense because it's frankly the LED animation library is really the main thing that people want to do this with. Um, however, it's pseudo on hold because there's a very basic feature, animation sequence, that no longer works on M0. Uh, I found this while testing it to make sure that the animations that I listed off were still the same that we couldn't run and that all the, re all the rest of them were still viable. Um, and I'm not sure I want to write this page with the caveat that sequence doesn't even work. Um, it needs to be refactored to um, be f to, to work again on, on M0. Um, but I still want the page regardless because I think it'll be super helpful to folks, and I have started it, but testing made me pause. And I have various miscellaneous things to do, and then more pretty pins diagrams, and that's what I have going on. All right. And despite me giving you a hard time, your update lasted uh, less long than mine did, so... Uh, I'm just being mean to you, I guess. Uh, anyway, next up is Maker Melissa and then Scott. Go ahead, Melissa. Okay, hello. Uh, last week I was out a few days uh, due to an adverse reaction to the booster shot, um, but I'm feeling better now. I tested out the CircuitPython uh, SSD1681 e-ink driver. I fixed uh, 
read the docs from failing on platform detect and I added pen alarm and touch alarm support to portal base and this week I'm gonna te uh, work on testing out Raspberry Pi with the new OS that just got released today uh, I'm gonna fix any issues I come across and then after that I'll possibly start on learn guide for the circuit python code editor and that's it all right thank you um and you said that carter did uh, already give it a quick test was that test looking good yeah um it seemed good i wanted to test uh it on the pi 4 along with a, a couple other issues people were reporting recently and so i just figured i'd do it all at the same time Great, thank you. Next up is Scott. Hello. Um, I was struggling a little bit last week with USB troubles. I so didn't quite make the progress that I wanted to. I spent a lot of get frustrated capital on getting frustrated with non CircPython stuff. Uh, but yesterday I put in a new motherboard in my computer, so hopefully I won't have to deal with that. Uh, this week, just got to send off my other one to get fixed. Um, I got CircuitPython compiling for the 02W, uh, and the UR output is working. However, input is not, uh, because it depends on the interrupts, which I had forgotten, uh, and then immediately found that, yeah, I actually do need interrupts working. Um, so I'm working on that. It's uh, got a different interrupt controller from the Pi 4, so uh, it's good work to do because it applies to basically all of the other Pis. Um, so I'm just going to keep fi finishing that up. Um, and then I also put out a call for like a tiny USB like library for the SD MMC cards. It turns out Ivan, uh, IGRR wrote the IDF version based on the open BSD code and is open to actually splitting it out of the IDF into a separate library. So I've started tweaking it for CircuitPython and plan on collaborating with the ESP Espresso folks, uh, so that we can actually have, a a library very similar to tiny usb i think uh, that they can use in the idf and we can use in circuit python and it will manage kind of all of the standard uh sd card stuff for us um so this week uh i'm gonna try to get everything going on the 02w um uh, basically to the point that the pi 4 is at um tomorrow i'll be on the tom's hardware pi cast which i'm looking forward to to talk about all of this CircuitPython Raspberry Pi stuff, that's at 10.30 Pacific. So if you want to watch it, I think you can find it on YouTube. Um, once I do the UART stuff, I want to get the SD card reading and writing working from CircuitPython C code. So that's just like getting it working there. And then the next step is to connect it up to CircuitPython as a file system. And once it's working as a file system, then figuring out how to expose the SD card over USB. I might just treat it like internal flash uh at the start but in the longer term i think it would be cool to actually like have sd cards supported kind of more properly because sd cards have the challenge that they can be ejected <laughs> so that's a that's a new one for us to handle on the internals of circuit python is what happens what happens when our our uh, file system file system disappears oh and then the other thing that i'm going to try to do is uh on my stream this week, I want to highlight all of the editors that we've got going. So the work that Melissa did is is really far along and looks really good. So I want to start uh, encouraging folks to try that out. Um, on the iOS app side, we have uh, PyLeap and File Glider, and I think they're both currently set up so we could actually give out uh, beta access to those apps as well. Um, they're doing pretty good, so uh, I want to test test those this week, find any issues, and, and try to start getting particularly this group of folks um, testing it out and seeing what you find. Um, and start a, like trying to, trying to start the iteration loop between people trying it and the folks working on it fixing things. So check a look, <laughs> uh, keep an eye out for that. It should be really, really neat. And that's just the beginning of all the BLE workflow stuff. So it's going to be cool. Thanks, Scott. Back mm -hmm. up at the top of the alphabet, I've got notes from C. Grover, and then uh, we will hear from Charles Berniford. All right, so C. Grover writes, working feverishly on a set of retro graphic widgets for display I.O. 
The project is heavily inspired by the work of Foamy Guy, but he uses, or but C. Grover's version uses a normalized screen addressing scheme rather than pixel counting in the hopes of achieving some screen size independence. Uh, they've completed two widgets, a magic eye tuning indicator and an animated kitchen scale like object. Had some fun with floor to rectangular conversions in the process. And then starting to examine how to create some new display IO graphics primitives to help with arcs and donut circles. Also looking at issues with accuracy of polygon shapes when compared to rect. I'm expecting that it will be an intense and useful learning opportunity. All right, next up is Charles, and then after that we'll go to Dan. Sorry, I took a little while to get back to the uh, my uh, Discord. All right, well, well, we're ready for you. Okay, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the... I'm really looking forward to bus IO and... Uh, and... Uh, yeah, HID MIDI, because I really want to build a... Uh, I'm dying to build a circuit py bare metal circuit Python uh, MIDI sequencer. Because I've got I've got the basic code for the version I wrote for Blinka, and I want to see if I can convert it to bare metal. See what happens with that. And some of the controls are on I2C, so I sort of need bus I/O uh, I2C. So I hope that happens real soon. Uh, uh, soon, uh, Scott. All right, well, keep us posted on your progress with that as it goes, Charles. I certainly will. Thank you. All right. Um, next up is Dan, and then I'll have notes from David. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'm continuing to work on being able to use async, the async I.O. library in CircuitPython. And uh, last week I had done a demo where you could blink two LEDs independently of each other. They kept their own rates. Uh, this time I made a small demo of uh, making two servos run in synchrony, but without knowing about each other. So um, they're stepping through a range of motion and over a period of time. So they're stopping uh, to wait for a delay every little bit. And when one stops, the other one runs and then they, they take turns. So this is good for, for instance, the learn guide that has uh, fairy wings that you wear on your back so that the, the wings would uh, work in synchrony and not bump into each other. Um, so the result of all this is that uh, currently what we have does work, what, I, what I've worked on so far. There are a small number of changes to CircuitPython and a small number of changes to the async IO Python code for MicroPython. And what I think what I'll do is release this for other people to try. I'll make a PR that has the necessary CircuitPython changes, which are not incompatible with what's happening already. And I'll, I already have a repo of the async IO library, and I'll publish that and put it in the uh, bundle. And I'll write up a guide with some examples and um, say that it's experimental and have people try things so that we had talked about making CircuitPython 8 focus on async um, uh, and cooperative multitasking, but we might get there sooner than that. Um, and the other thing, the things that we then need to do are come up with um, ways of, uh, say, monitoring pins for transitions that are compatible with using them in async. Count IO already does the interrupt stuff that we do, do, but it doesn't have an async API. So we might add an async API to count IO or add something to digital IO that has an async API or have some kind of wrapper. It's not really clear yet. And I still also want to make, it's really easy to make mistakes when you write these async IO programs. And I want to um, maybe come up with some more helper uh, functions and some class maybe in async IO that would make it less likely for you to make mistakes. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Dan. 
Uh, next, I will read notes from David, and we will end the section with Foamy Guy. So David writes, in the past, printed my COVID pass QR code with a clue on the BLE CAT thermal printer, and it worked flawlessly with the security guard and his scanner. There is a link to Twitter in the notes. Works in progress. Adapt CPI Basic that was made for the Titano to work on the normal size Pi portal. There's a link to GitHub, again in the notes doc. Trying to adapt the radio controller to build a joystick USB HID, another GitHub link in the notes doc. The goal is to use a Cutie Pie to transform a Wii Super Nintendo SNES Classic Mini Controller CLV202 into a USB controller. And then as for the future, I have a Pi 02W waiting to be used with CircuitPython, and I have the new ATtiny817 Seesaw. Never did anything with the old Seesaw, but the new one has a great guide and stemma connector, so I have great hope to use it. All right, and Foamy Guy, once again, you get to play us out. And thanks for getting those links. All right, uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, last week, I... Um, we looked into MVM a little bit and wanted to try to make it a little bit easier. So I ended up making and releasing a library in the community bundle that uses uh, message pack, which was added a few months back to the core. And it gives you a simple API to store and retrieve arbitrary objects in the NVM without worrying uh, about the details because the normal API built in is a little bit low level. You have to kind of pack everything into bytes and worry about how many there are and that sort of stuff. So. Um, now we have some nice, easy functions inside of a, a helper library. Um, I also worked on a list select widget that will draw a list of strings and let you move up and down a little selector caret. Um, and then you can check which one is currently selected. So this should be pretty helpful for making um, you know, menus and things like that in Display.io applications. So I hope to get that published up this week. Um, and then last week, I also had um, an interesting first experience, the first time I ever messed with KMK. Uh, so I built up a little very small proof of concept with just two keys on a breadboard. Uh, the little Neo key breakouts were super helpful for that. And I learned how to uh, get that running, configure the uh, pins and the keys and the layers, and how to make macros for it and that sort of stuff. So it was a, a real fun uh, first time dive into that project for me. Um, this week, I am going to work on a new page in the display text guide. This will show how to properly update a label over time. Uh, we see a lot of times folks will come to the help with room or uh, the forms and they'll post their project asking for help and they have um, a, a fair number of them have the same issue, which is that they end up trying to make a new label each time through the main loop instead of updating the existing one. And eventually, uh, well, actually pretty quickly, they run out of memory. Um, so that's not that's not what we want. So we'll make a page that shows how to do that and explain the you know the most common problem that you might see if you do it the wrong way uh, and how to correct it. Um, and then uh, I still intend to look into the stubs and generator and figure out the best way to package like PYI files with libraries that aren't currently on PyPy. Um, so that's what I got going. Thanks. All right. Thank you. And now we will head down to In the Weeds, and I will let Katni introduce her first topic. Link. Okay. Uh, scrolling. All right. So uh, the first topic should be quick. Um, Hacktoberfest is still on 22 issues, primarily the CircuitPython core. I just wanted to know from uh, Scott and, and Dan whether and, and Jeff whether you guys want those left alone or do you want them removed? I just remove them. Okay, I just want to make sure you didn't have, you know, I don't know, an attachment to them or something. Um, <laughs> Thank you. No, I think I like they've moved away from that model anyway. So like, because it's done at the repo level now. So I, right. I don't, think, I don't think they're useful anymore. Okay. Um. Sounds good. Uh. We'll get that taken care of. Um. Second topic. Uh. I broke the docs. Um. With my update. And my question is, do we care about adding Sphinx to the, the, um, re the, actu the actual requirements.txt file for the libraries? It means it will install on the computers of everyone using Blinka, and it's not needed. But for reasons that I can explain, um, it would make things a lot easier for me, and, and it would avoid duplicating requirements.txt in every existing library repo. It's not needed on new libraries, so cookie cutter doesn't require an update. 
does anybody care? Can you tell me real quick why it's not required on new libraries, but would be needed on the old ones? It's not required on new libraries because Read the Docs does not need to be told to use the latest version of Sphinx on um, any of the new libraries because it automatically, like as of last October, um, is using the latest Sphinx by default. So only libraries that were created before that time um, need to have Sphinx and requirements.txt to be running anything newer than 1.8.5 and they're up to 4.2. Well, what I did when I was fixing the platform detect repo is I actually had a separate requirements.txt under docs and then I just pointed that in the read uh, the docs uh, 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 config file. Yes. So that works. However, it breaks the documentation when there are um, requirements such as Blinka or NeoPixel or any other libraries because we don't auto mock anymore because of the fact that uh, Sphinx can actually find the libraries if they install them from requirements.txt. Um, and so what's happening is that documentation that has any major requirements, for example, the MagTag library, um, it passes locally because the both requirements.txts are used locally. And then when it tries to build remotely, it can't find the libraries because they're they're not either auto-mocked or um, installed from requirements.txt. So this, the, the solution is two th one of two things. Either I need to duplicate requirements.txt into the docs folder plus Sphinx which means we have to update two requirements.txt files every time we update any libraries to have any other requirements. Or two, we add Sphinx to the current requirements.txt, um, revert the docs file to be using the one that's in the root directory, and everything will work. There's another option. You can actually just have it with the Sphinx in it inside the docs, and then in the um, script that goes and runs uh, when you go and when GitHub Actions is done, mm -hmm. you can have it at, just run both of the requirements. Oh, you can add multiple. Re so to the read the docs.yaml file, you mean? Um, you, well, you could um, put that in. Oh, hold on, let me look up what the name of the. Because the, the issue isn't is. GitHub Actions. The issue is read the docs. Read the docs doesn't use GitHub Actions. Right. I'm um, just. Okay, hold on just a second. Okay. Yeah, look it, it up really it, quick. It it seems weird to me that you would have different behavior based on when you created the library. That's just what it's, they do. It that much is true. It, it's just a fact. That's not anything to do with us. That's how Read the Docs decided to do it. They just decided, as of a particular time, they would run a new version, and everything created before that continues to run the old version unless you tell it otherwise. Well, how do we tell it otherwise? Okay, here, I just posted a link in here that goes to the line that uses that requirements. If you have the pip install and point it to the docs requirements as well, or you could even like look at that it exists first, um, then you could have it install the requirements inside there, and then it doesn't have to install on everyone else's computer. Okay. The, the fix not, is to put a requirement. That's not for read the docs, right? This is not run for read the docs. This no. is for actions. Yeah, that's what I'm right. saying. Right. Like but doesn't read the docs happen in it? Oh, you're saying in the, um, I got you now. Yeah, the I'm the talking docs remotely. Um, it's so in the, the, read the docs config file, you can actually tell it the requirements in there as well. That's what I, I did still, with. But can you do two requirements files? Yep. Yes. But you totally. have to include all the files in both of them and then Sphinx in the one that's in the docs folder which means there's two files you have to update if you update any of the requirements for that library. Wait, why why does why do you need the de, the library's dependencies in both the requirements files if Because read the docs them? Well, or... because read the docs only looks at one. Okay. Um, I just posted like when I edited the read the docs okay. and this, is, this it, is the fix. in platform detect. Okay, uh, I didn't I, know you could then, do two. Yeah. This, this is the fix. Okay. Oh, okay. So you still well, need two, but only one of them, the, the one that's in docs just has Sphinx in it and the other one has all the all the things. The reason you need both is because, remember we used to auto mock, auto doc, mock import everything? Yep. We don't, I'm telling Scott, we, we don't do that anymore. 
No, because it always um, created weird problems. Because it installs the libraries from requirements.txt and then actually finds them legitimately. Yeah, I know. So if I know, if, I know so if we about. if we switch read the docs.yaml to only use the docs one, which doesn't include all the libraries, right, right. it fails remotely. Okay, then I guess I don't understand your question. Well, it. I don't know that I don't know the background of what read the docs has changed, but if if there is this hard cutoff between like the new way and the old way, mm -hmm. like you you mentioned that you can we can opt the old libraries into the new way, like. The thing no, you can opt is still not quite what you get. There, there's no way for you to opt the old ones to act like the new ones without the read the docs YAML file. That is not w without deleting and recreating your project, which is. Yeah, we would have to delete like 280 read the docs projects and recreate them oh, all. Yeah. Uh, on the read the docs. Uh, on the read the docs the website, yeah. Um... So like doing this to the existing libraries is the fix. Can can what? Let's wait. Um, okay. Wait because I actually we could talk to the read the docs folks and be like, hey, can you just upgrade all of our stuff? Uh, potentially, because like what I'm trying to avoid is like having this gulf of these ones work one way and these ones work another way forever, right? Like, ideally, they should work all the same. <laughs> I think okay. that if we put the config.yaml file in, they will all work the same. I don't follow. If we put the read the docs YAML file in all of their repositories, they would all behave the same. But no, you, but... Katni, I think I've just been putting the file in the old ones to get similar to the current behavior, but it's still not quite it's the same. It's in the existing libraries. The I didn't update libraries. Cookie Cutter because new libraries are already running the latest and they don't need it. I mean, here's the deal, right? There are broken documentation situations right now, and this is a quick fix to deal with that. If we want to talk to read the docs and have them update things, that's great. I don't see that happening overnight, and I do see us needing documentation that works. No, I mean, I get that, but I, w I want to make sure that the work that you're doing, especially if it's involving a lot of libraries, is the right direction, right? Like, if, like Jeff's point is like, well, for all of our libraries, we need to have this read the docs yaml file and therefore they'll work all the same that's good and it worries me a little bit like i don't have the i haven't seen the context for the change that read the docs did um but we probably don't want to be in a world where we auto update sphinx um it's and we, prob and we pin sphinx in that doc slash requirements dot text file but okay. I also hate pinning things because it means we <laughs> forget to do anything with them until it's like six versions later and then yeah. all of our docs are failing and we wonder why. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's a matter, it's a, yeah. We, we haven't locally pinned Sphinx in a long time. Like we've been dealing with, with Sphinx updates for, I, I'm not sure how long I could go back and find the PR when we changed it, but. Mm -hmm. We, we've been running latest locally for like a while. It's right. just, we were not running latest remotely on previously existing libraries. Okay. So it's, I, I don't know, it's just, it's just how, I, I didn't know that Sphinx made, the, or that um, Read the Docs Read the made Docs. this change until I stumbled on the fact that there was documentation that was passing locally and failing remotely, and that was why. Right, right. Yeah, it's documented somewhere very deep in the documentation of Read the Docs that if your repo, if you're, no, if you're, Read the Docs project was created before a cutoff date. It always uses a 1.8.x read the docs. And after that, it's using the latest read the docs. But both of those are overridden by having the read the docs YAML file to configure exactly what you want. So that's ultimately the way to get what we want, right. including whether we want a particular pinned version or whether we want the newest. We can get either of those, but we just have to put the file everywhere. But what Katni is doing is like she says, tackling the more immediate problem of there are these repos where the docs on read the docs aren't updating because the build always fails. And that's right. the short term goal to fix. And I think, yeah, I, I think that this trick from Melissa is going to be the shortest path to that and without repeating these requirements. So to, can it, you can you please link that thing you're, you're referring to, like this buried doc thing about 
yeah, behavior. Yeah, I'll, I'll find it if Katni doesn't want to. It, we had it in a in a private chat, but I do have the link somewhere. I just don't want to click over there right now while we're uh, okay. while I'm screen recording. <laughs> yeah, I am well, so not. I, yeah, I'm not sure um, what the link was, so I'll let Jeff find it. Okay, I'll I'll add that on Discord after the meeting in the text channel. Yeah, so it's it's it sounds to me that the approach Katni is suggesting is the right way. So for the old for the old libraries that are not working right now, we'll add a read the docs.yaml that has a list of two requirements on it. The doc requirements will have the Sphinx version that we want, which will not be pinned, so it'll just say Sphinx. Um, and then I think what we should plan on doing is that going forward, so adding the cookie cutter and all of the other libraries, we should probably just have those that same setup. Um, so add the requirements with Sphinx in it for all of the new libraries as well, and and add the YAML too. But the YAML already exists. Like the the file okay. has existed this whole time. It's just it's been updated. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So that'll be less churn, which is nice. Yeah, it's just it's just adding to an existing file. Right, and so that'll get us to the point where all of our libraries behave the same way when um, it comes yes. to read the docs. Yep. Awesome. Thank you for doing that work. Yep. Which one of you is going to file that issue? I'll just do it. I'm not going to file the issue. I'll just straight up update it. Okay. Thanks, Katni. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Melissa. It's easier for... to update it to give um, some place to base the Adabot patch off of anyway. So mm -hmm. I'll update it in Cookie Cutter. And thanks, Melissa, for already knowing the secret solution. <laughs> No problem. I was like, researching it last week because I was like, why is this failing? <laughs> All right. If there's nothing else, Weird. then, uh, and unless anybody else's cat wants to meow, I will take us to wrap up. My cats are asleep. Okay. So, um, this has been the Circuit Python Weekly Meeting for November 15th, 2021. No, that's not right. I'm reading what it says on the screen, but that's the date of the next weekend, November 15th. The next meeting. <laughs> next, we're going to wrap up the meeting. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. This has been the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for November 8th, 2021. The next meeting will be on November 15th, 2021, as regularly scheduled. Um, thanks to everyone who participated today. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, as well as those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will re be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on all major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. Uh, as I said, the next meeting will be held next Monday, as usual, at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. This meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. To be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. We hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.